I'll take over here with uh, the key things that played out in the market. When we're looking at the market, the top half of this chart, we're going to talk a little bit about, put a perspective on 2020 and what actually happened in the fourth quarter. There was quite a shift, as you kind of saw in the data, but let's talk what was behind it. And then a little bit of what we're seeing, the trend moving into 2021, we're here now. Uh, what do we believe is going to be playing out that started to show up in the fourth quarter uh, as things changed? So now hindsight is always 2020. When we look at the COVID recovery, if you remember, everybody's talking about, is this going to be a V recovery? Is this going to be a W recovery? Is it going to be a recovery? Nobody had a clue, but a lot of people were forecasting different scenarios of how that economy was and markets were going to play out. Turns out that we have actually what's called a K-shaped recovery. And what happened was because of the shutdown, it actually created winners and losers in the marketplace. And when we look at who came out ahead, these market leaders were basically, as you see on the right side here, online businesses. The residential real estate market really took off and maintained high uh, increases in the values. Uh, growth, primarily driven by technology stocks, were big winners in, in the uh, 2020. Uh, again, those are the big six stocks in the S&P really were driving the market. And the market as a whole, the indexes, seemed to do fairly well uh, from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. The losers turned out to be your brick and mortar retail. Why? Because we were shut down and they were closed. They were basically not allowed to operate. Commercial real estate, you know, people were working at home and when companies were able to unload properties because they didn't need them through leases and stuff like that, they started doing that this year. Value stocks did not play out well because those are your traditional products that, and services that are sold in those brick and mortar stores. So they took a hit. Basically, besides six companies, the other 494 stocks in the S&P went down during the shutdown and struggled to come back. And that's because of the situations with COVID and trying to start the economy up, but then having to, to revert back and slow down reopening. A lot was going on due to COVID. So the economy overall really was a loser in last year. Okay, this chart, basically what we're talking about here, it, there's two slides here put together because they relate. On the left side, what we're showing is what happened that actually caused the recovery in much of the market and the indexes is because the Fed, as we say on the left side, cut rates in record time in 2020. And what this is comparing is three different periods when the Fed's cut rates. And the first is the, the blue line starting at when the Fed fund target rate was 6.5% back in 2000. If you look at that line, they started cutting rates during the tech crash of the 2000s, the dot-com crash. And it took them basically, if you look at the bottom of the graph, over 30 months to bring rates down from 65 down to about 1% when things flattened out in 2002 and started being in a position where they could start increasing uh, interest rates. Look at the next section, the dark blue or black line is the 2007 to 2009 financial crisis. And the Fed fund rates were 5.25% when this started. And over the next 30 plus months, they reduced rates down to zero to really try to stimulate the economy, made borrowing very cheap, try to start investing and grow the economy. Now look at the pink or red area on your screen. The Fed rate was about only two and a quarter starting out at the beginning of the year, and they immediately, inside of months, cut the Fed rate to zero. So. That was, that was reaction that was very, very fast and needed. And part of the reason, when you look now at the right side of this screen, how the markets responded. And you can see the light blue 
the market took a long time to recover. The dark blue in 2007 and 2009, the market recovered a little faster, but still was basically 1,426 days to get back to even. But look at how fast in 2020 the market came back, the red line, 128 days because of how the Fed jumped in and began to create some stimulus and some Fed policy of zero interest rates that allowed companies to go out and borrow money to maintain their business. And because of that, the market responded, the stock values came back quickly in response to that. So let's move on to the next area. Market leadership was centered on just a few stocks though. While we saw major indexes increasing, when we dissect and look into really what was going on inside the S&P, the reality is there was only six companies that were really, really taking off. Again, because they were allowed to operate during a time most of the companies were not. So the money flooded into those companies in the stock market and drove them up and also drove the indexes up. What companies are we talking about? We're talking about Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Amazon, Microsoft, and Alphabet, which is Google. And that's what these blue lines on the left side of your screen represent, is how much of a return those six companies had versus the rest of the S&P, up 57.9% while the S&P overall was up only 15.1. And then when you look at the right side of the screen, this looks at the 20 stocks that were the best performers outside of the U.S. This is the ex-U.S. companies, and I don't have the list of them, but these are the, the European and, and foreign companies that profited during COVID. They were up 47.6%, that's the blue line, versus the total international market was only up 14.1%. So again, you see that very small number of companies, both in the US and internationally, actually drove the overall indexes and kept them positive for the year. The fourth quarter, however, we saw some of this starting to change a little bit. As you can see on the left side, the other 494 companies started a comeback through October through December of 46.6%. So the rest of the S&P started to participate in this market growth, and we believe that is going to continue into 2021. So that's one of our themes, is that other companies now with the COVID situation, with the vaccine coming out, we believe that these other companies are going to be able to get back on track and bring some of the performance back into your portfolios. Uh, so there could be some shifts going on by the money managers as we evaluate this. When you look at the right side of the screen, it breaks down the large cap versus small cap. Who was the big winners earlier? Was the large cap. But what happened in the fourth quarter? We saw a major shift where now the small cap companies are now starting to outperform and again bring balance back into the market. Again, all this is to show you what's really going on and why you need to be diversified in the market moving forward. And one of the questions we keep getting asked is, well, but aren't stocks overvalued? You know, should we be in the stock market? Well, this again is giving you a picture of the PE ratios of the S&P going back to 1990 through 2020. And what you can see here is in uh, the year 2000, the big five tech company PEs, if you look at the red box on the left, their PE ratio of the top five tech companies in 2000 was 60.4. That's huge versus the other 495 companies, their PE ratio was only 21 price to earnings. So what this is telling us is that those companies probably were in a bubble. When their, their price to earnings is a 60 point factor versus the rest of the uh, S&P 500 was only at 21. So they were overvalued. That's what caused the tech bubble and the tech 
dot-com, what they called the dot-com crash back in 2000. So it didn't affect everybody as much as it affected the dot-com companies. But look at those PE ratios in relationship to where we're at today. So in November of 2020, the top five tech companies, their PE ratio is only 32.2 versus the rest of the S&P, which is at 25.3. Much more in line than what we saw back in 2000 with the dot-com crash. So we believe that the, eva the valuations are elevated, but nowhere near the bubble territory that we saw back in the dot-com crash. And if we had it on here, it would show you that historically, the average for the S&P runs around 18 to 20. So we're not that far overvalued relative to price versus earnings on the S&P. Another reason that stocks we believe are not that expensive moving forward is when we look at the stock prices relative to bonds. As Dan alluded to earlier, we are in a secular bear market for bonds. And if you look at the, the bond yields from 2006 through 2020, for the last 15 years, bonds really have not given us much of a return. In fact, they were negative in 2006, and they have turned positive as the economy improved after uh, the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. But returns of one to one and a half percent are nowhere near the historical average of four to six percent expectation on the yield on a bond. And we believe that's going to stay that way. And again, another reason that stocks, while overvalued from a price earning standpoint, may not be relative to other investments and asset classes out there. So again, looking at returns from fixed income, when we look at what happened in the last year, we did get positive returns from TIPS, U.S. Treasuries, corporates, the uh, overall aggregate U.S. bond market, globals had uh, a good return, um, emerging markets had positive returns, and even uh, high yield have uh, positive returns between six and 8%. However, let's explain why the bonds rallied in 2020. Look at the note on the left. It's because the Fed stepped in, dropped interest rates, and then started a bond buying program. This was new to the markets and it bolstered the bond market and upheld it at a time where there was a lot of uncertainty in our stock and uh, our equity and bond markets. So the Fed seemed to have done the right thing to prop things up to help us when we were shutting down companies and closing businesses due to the COVID environment and trying to contain the spread of the virus. So overall, we saw a positive year. And even though we saw this in these bond prices, we're not expecting that to continue because the Fed will have to start selling off those assets as the economy gets stronger. Okay, so when we look at the uh, pandemic induced shutdown that really created the worst recession since the Great Depression and look at GDP, if we look at the blue box, the United States real growth, what we saw in 2019 was 2.2%. However, 2020, because of COVID, we basically lost and went negative in our gross domestic product for the year of 4.3%. However, what our projections are moving forward is that we have a pretty good, robust growth uh, possibility here of about 3.1% is what the economists are telling us. When we look at the Eurozone, the green box, you can see a similar situation. They, did, they were slower in 2019. Why we told you, you know, for the past year or two, we are invested primarily in the US because we have the higher growth. Um, but look at what happened in Europe due to COVID. They went down twice as far as we did in economic growth and activity. They lost 8.3% year over year. However, they're expected to recover quite well and actually potentially outperform us per the economist. One of the reasons Dan touched on that we are going to be looking at more international as bringing some of that back into the portfolio for 2021. 
Again, the money managers are evaluating this and moving forward. Emerging markets, the light blue box on the right, they were robust in uh, 2019, 3.7% growth rate in the uh, emerging markets, gross domestic product. They dropped significantly too, 3.3% in 2020. However, again, 2021 was a very robust opportunities for growth. So we want to participate from an investment standpoint in these market growth opportunities going into 2021. And that kind of covers it for me on the key themes for the markets. Uh, Dan's going to come on and we're going to be talking a little bit about the portfolios and how that plays out. But what do you think about the overall market trends and, and the, the opportunities we see moving forward? Yeah, well, it's really interesting. And this is where when you're looking at portfolio management uh, and one of the reasons why we keep saying tactical, tactical, tactical. Uh, because at the end of the day, you're going to have different aspects of the market that are going to do well, others that aren't going to do quite as well. Now, you have to have some kind of structured portfolio that gives you a little bit of a base uh, in, the, in the growth of the portfolio. But if you're not tactically minded when it comes to managing the portfolio, you are going to find yourself lagging in the overall returns because you'll be participating in the losses as well as some of the gains, which is more designed like a structured portfolio. So with our firm, you're gonna find that the majority of the portfolios that are being used are more tactical, and we look at outside investments to really balance it out. So let's talk a little bit about the um, key things in the portfolios and moving forward. 